Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you before we get started i have a quick favor i've been self-funding the finding genius podcast for five years now i've done over three thousand episodes and as you can see on youtube we're up over a million views on the channel which is fantastic the next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up. And check in the description for Buy Me a Coffee. It's about five bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going. And I love coffee. Thank you. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1%. A real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius Podcast for four and a half years now which has led to 2,700-plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000-plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from $10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar, and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now, back to the show. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Karis Johnston. Uh, she runs her own farm up in the uh, Dallas metro area, and I wanted to talk to her about uh, you know what she does, what she's learned, and I guess she's also, uh, she sells things that, various local farmers markets. So we'll get into all that info. So Karis, thanks for coming. You're welcome. I'm excited. Yeah. Well, if you would tell me about when did you first start thinking about, you know, growing your own food and, and farming? Well, oh, I call myself the nurse turned farmer. So I was actually a nurse first and worked at Parkland as actually an oncology nurse. And nurses, doctors, physical therapists, we all go into that profession wanting to help people and help them heal. And unfortunately, because I think it's because I was at the county hospital, I didn't really help people heal. I helped them die. And that was hard as a new nurse. And so I was really deeply impacted by that. And then when my husband and I decided to start a family, that's where that little seed started. Because you have these little, we have four kids, and you want to protect them, and you want to make their life better than your life. And so that's kind of where it was like, okay, that kind of opened the door to, I think I think we might need to do better by than what we're doing right now. And so actually, I don't, have you ever watched the documentary Food, Inc.? A uh, long time ago, I believe I watched yeah, it. Yeah, so, yeah, it was a long time ago. Like, we've only watched it once. And that documentary, like, changed, like, everything. It changed how we ate. It changed what we were doing. And then, of course, we have these kids. And I'm like, okay, we've got to be careful with them. So we got all the chemicals out of our home. We joined, like, a local CSA, which is a community-supported agriculture type thing, got our fruits and veggies through them, found a local meat farmer, 
found a local raw dairy. So literally that one documentary changed how we were doing everything with our family health-wise. So that was kind of where we first opened that door. What did you notice as you got the chemicals out and as you changed your food sources? Well, because our kids didn't have anything but that, I mean, I can't tell you other than they just are sick very little. So, I mean, we've always tried to do local foods, local veggies, and um, especially that raw dairy. I know that's kind of like a, maybe I'm not allowed to say that, but um, it makes all the difference. I was highly allergic to milk growing up, but then when you, when I drank raw dairy, I had no issues. And so the same thing with my kids, you know, we discovered that like my oldest actually did have a dairy allergy. And when we did raw dairy with her, we had no problems. So there was definitely increased health in our family and our kids have been very healthy from the very beginning because if we just gave them as best a start as we knew how, especially as new parents. That's There's always that challenge. Well, that's great. Yeah. What about for you and your husband? I guess you you know, you know weren't always eating like this, so what did you notice no. for you guys' health? Yeah, so I think well, first as a nurse, I mean, I was just exposed to so many chemicals, right? So oncology, you're giving chemotherapy. So I'm around all kinds of mess, and honestly, what was – hardest on me was the soap we were using. You know, you want to have hospitals, you want them clean. (laughs) You don't want anything there. So I understand using very harsh things, but I literally would lose my fingerprints and I couldn't use the drug machine. So if I was to give, you know, drugs to the patients, I couldn't even open it because I had a lot, like it literally had stripped my body. So, you know, getting out of nursing was a good thing for my health (laughs) because it was very stressful. And then it was really hard on my body. And so taking chemicals out, you know, making sure the soaps were natural soaps and actually putting good foods. Like my body detoxed after being through, you know, that four or five years. I I didn't, I went to school for four years and only went, you know, was a professional nurse for four years. So it didn't last very long, you know, because we went straight into having our kids. But yes, we definitely noticed that our health was better. And then it, you know, we learned how to cook different things. And I'm, I'm not a, a great baker or cooker of things. I, I'm the hard worker. I'd rather be out in the middle of the field doing all the hard work. And I, I'm like, Jesus, can you please send me a child that would love to cook for our family? We've not really had that, but we do, we do eat, we do eat well. And we, we, we actually raise a hundred percent of our eggs, milk and meat um, on our farm. Wow. So. How much um, outside food do you guys have as a family? Do you eat everything you make or do you eat out sometimes? <laughs> Uh, we don't eat out very often. Since we are a one-income family, we're kind of conservative with our budget. Um, we do have to buy fruits and vegetables. Um, I'd love to say I'm a really great canner. I, truthfully, it's a great skill to know, but I do not like canned vegetables. So I'm much more apt to dehydrate a vegetable or a um, freeze it. So we do have some of those, but I'm here to tell you the fruit tree thing. Like, Every, you see fruit trees, right, at Walmart and Home Depot. Mm-hmm. Like, they're everywhere, especially in the spring. And we're like, oh, let's let's plant some fruit trees. Well, you plant one fruit tree, and every bug in the neighborhood knows you have that fruit tree. <laughs> and it will be, you know, and a lot of people say, well, it's the squirrels or it's the birds. But for me, it's bugs because we don't have the, the trees around or whatever. But it's the, the orchard, the fruit making, that's been the challenge, and especially organically because we try really hard to not use chemicals on our farm. And that's that's a challenge when you have these bugs. They're like, we love that fruit more than you do. Have you found any any solutions, any organic solutions? Like have you spoken to people that, you know, grow these orchards organically and what they do? So I'll be honest, I have not found anybody local that can really grow their orchard organically. So I've been to several orchards, and they heavily spray them. And even – even my local ag extension agents kind of like, you know, you probably should just use some chemicals. <laughs> Thus, we kind of share our fruit right now. So I, I've made up some sprays with different essential oils, a little bit of soap, and that will help be like a really good like dormant, like when it's going into dormancy or when it's starting to wake up from dormancy. But the I have not come up with a really great um, solution. Yeah, I've tried all kinds of recipes online. You know, there's lots of information available, but sometimes that information does not actually work. Um, so no, I don't have a great solution for that. We just, you know, we keep planting trees. We probably plant a dozen or so each year. And so what does it take usually about three or four or five years for that fruit tree to actually start to produce. So, you know, when it starts producing, I start paying a little more attention to it. We try to bring, um, chickens into that area to kind of help clean up underneath the trees 
So that's that's part of having sustainable farms, kind of learning. Okay, I don't want to I don't don't want to bring as much input in. What do I have that can work? You know, to help with this. So we don't have a hundred percent on that, but that's just the way farming works. So you, I wonder if you could put like a um, you know a fine mesh net over the trees so bugs couldn't get in, but they could still get sunlight and oxygen and everything. So I have not seen that for they there I've seen that for like a row crop cover so like you know these long sheets that you can put over top of plants in a field I suppose you could do that in your orchard but typically I mean orchards are a lot larger so I, I don't have a, a good answer to that other than we're still working on trying to developing something that is as organic as possible or you know like I said we we get some fruit and the bugs get some fruit right so yes they always say plant more. You're planting more for the, the, the bunny that gets into your garden. You're planting more for that deer that gets in your garden, right? So I think it, you just keep planting, planting, planting. At some point, you are able to, you know, harvest so much more. Oh, but so you're able to get fruit, just the bugs oh, yes. eat, you know, a, a yes. percentage of it. Yes. It's like a bug tax. I got gotcha. you. Yes. Okay. Interesting. So, um, you know, I kind of skipped forward, but so what is your what does your homestead look like? Is it a farm at your house, or like how big is this operation? Like, what, what does it look like for you? Yeah, so we have when we moved in 2014 from the McKinney area, so that's in North North Texas, to a little further North Texas, like we're right below the the Oklahoma border. We found 27 acres, and it was before the big boom. And it's hilly, and it's beautiful, and it was actually really scary because we. When we went from McKinney, so that's where we raised all our kiddos, and then we just outgrew our home. They needed – we have two boys, and they need space, right? So ultimately, that's why we started looking was we needed – we just needed space for our kids. And we found this land, found this hill, has a home on it, nothing else. There was no other infrastructure on it. And it's funny how, like, within six months of now having land, it's like, let's fill it with all kinds of things. And so, like, we got our first livestock guardian dog, and we got 20 chicks. And they say that chickens are like the gateway animal to all things homesteading, and that is very true. So, wow. like, that was when I was like, okay, I've got to read books. I've got to, like, watch videos. And so I read, I don't know if you know who Joel Salatin is, but he is an exceptional. So I was just reading all of his books. I attended a whole bunch of, like, Mother Earth news fairs. We went to our, you know, county ag extension office, went to several Noble Foundation field days. Noble Foundation is up in Oklahoma, and it's a fabulous organization that tries to help you know, farmers kind of get up on their feet. And that's ultimately how we started. So we had the 27 acres and we bought these chickens and read all these books. And then it's been interesting every year that, you know, we've been farming, we realize how very little we actually know about anything. And that's why it's been really important for us to make sure we stay connected to other growers and other farmers. And of course, we, you know, we have our faith. And so we, we ask God all the time, we're like, hey, what do we do? We need some wisdom here. We need some guidance. So that's kind of how it started. So that's, that's how that looks. And then I would, you know, we will believe in sustainability, you know, sustainability being, you know, creating kind of a self-sustaining system. And, you know, we have just, we have three different types of animals. We do cows, goats, and chickens. We have tried others. Right now that seems to be what works for us. Kids are our, our helpers. And so we don't have any like employees or anything. So it's me and the kiddos doing this farming thing. And oh, wow. um, they the animals kind of move in a circle. So the cows, we worked really hard to try to get them. We're not quite at 100% mob grazing, but mob grazing is where you section off like a day or two's worth of grass, and you just move them, move them, move them, move them, and so you force them to eat maybe not their favorite food there. I mean, because believe it or not, cows have like favorite grasses and favorite weeds. And if you portion it off in small places like that, they're forced to eat more, and then it actually helps create a richer pasture environment so we're, we're moving towards that right now they kind of move more like paddocks so we've got like six or seven paddocks that they move each week or so um, and then we've got goats and so the cows are our meat the goats we have for milk and those move kind of like in paddocks also front to back and then we have chickens everywhere and chickens again going back to the gateway animal they're really interesting because they have this the superpower of like digging but if you don't harness it, it ruins everything, right? So, like, I, I do have to fence my gardens from my chickens. And I let them in when I want them to actually, like, you know, get the bugs and maybe take the garden down for the year or whatever. So the chickens have been really fun, but sometimes we also would like to shoot the chickens. So um, so that's our kind of the animals on our space. And then 
we do, um, so again, with kind of the sustainable portion of farming, we do collect most of the rainwater. We get them off our house and our barn and our shed. And then we've got a hoop house that's still not fully set up, and we're going to collect water off that so we can help with the plant starts. We make our own compost. Since we've got the cows, we actually collect that manure, and we almost always have a big pile of bark mulch somewhere, and we combine it with that. And it usually takes about six months for that to break down. And then I mentioned that we plant, you know, fruit trees every year. We also have – we do – we don't do just one crop. I don't I don't know how people do that, but we, we do pretty much every vegetable out there unless it's something we won't even touch. Like, we don't love eggplant, so we really don't ever plant any eggplant. We don't love turnips, so sometimes I'll get requests at farmer's market, and I'll be like, okay, I'll plant some turnips for you, and, you know, we'll do things like that. But, um, you know, having that diversity of crops, you know, we make sure we put flowers and herbs all together, and then that brings in the bug, the good bugs to help get rid of the bad bugs. Because there's three, there's usually three types of bugs I battle every year, the harlequin beetles, the uh, cucumber beetles, and then the squash bugs. And, I mean, like, you, if you get online and you search those things, people will tear in their tearing their hair out, and they stop growing those things because they're so bad sometimes. So there's, there's still, you know, we, we still have to figure out sometimes how to deal with those pests, but it's just learning how to plant at different times or put in a different flower or a different herb to help with that. So the animals, you said, you, so you, don't, you haven't tried ducks and you haven't tried quail or rabbits or we meat? Did, or, we yeah. did try ducks. They were gross and unruly, and we just, we didn't like them. The bunnies, because I have kids, like, I think it would be really hard to eat the bunnies. So we eat the cows. We do have a couple of friends that do do meat rabbits, and, you know, they multiply very quickly, which is nice. So it's a pretty quick meat source. Um, but, again, you have to have – you need to have a good kind of infrastructure for that, like a place in the barn to keep them out of, you know, the weather. Their, their rabbit manure is amazing. So, I mean, sometimes I'm like, I play with that idea. But I feel like my kids are going to need to be gone before we, like, really mess with that because they'd be like, they're too cute. Because we harvest, you know, we actually grow, do meat chicken. So we specifically do Cornish Cross. Those are those kind of frankenbirds. They grow super fast in about eight weeks, and we harvest those every eight weeks or so. So we try to do it four times a year. We don't do it in July and August because they won't make it. We actually just harvested this last weekend in of that batch, we lost eight because of the heat. So they have to be baby. Like we put fans on them. They had an automatic water going. Um, so, and that's hard enough for our family. The kids are like, oh, it's chicken harvest time again. Like they don't love it, but I mean, it's our meat. Like it's been fun. Like I believe everybody needs to come and experience the chicken harvest. I believe everybody needs to grow a garden because there's just so much that's, that's learned and understood you know, like where your food comes from and realizing, because, you know, we, you know, when I'm at farmer's market, people come, you know, when we're there in April and they're like looking for tomatoes and we're like, tomatoes do not get ripe till the end of June. You're going to have to wait. And so I think this, uh, um, people don't know. They just, you know, they used to go yeah. into Whole Foods or the HEV and just right. anything that's there is there all year round or mostly it is, or if not something else to replace it. So I, I, don't, I don't think people know that Certain things grow in certain seasons. You just don't think about it. Right, and I, that's why I feel like everybody needs to grow a garden. Just everybody needs to try once to grow a garden and kind of see what that seasonality looks like. Because, you know, if you're January, February, March, like, would we actually be able to live if there was no food at the grocery store? <laughs> like, I mean, I have to ask myself. I'm like, what do we, what do we, what can we grow in January, February, March? And greens, right? You can grow lots of different types of greens, but you're not going to have tomatoes. You're not going to have melons. You know, those take the heat, you know, to actually mature and grow. So I, I've got, we really love learning how to eat a little more seasonally. Do we always eat seasonally? No. I mean, we still have that convenience to the grocery store. We do know how to grow these foods. And, you know, we do have this hoop house that's still not fully set up. So we could force, you know, do it earlier. We could move some, like we could have tomatoes possibly in May instead of June, you know, if we were to utilize the, the hoop house, which, you know, provides that protection. Oh, like a greenhouse, right? It, yeah, so green greenhouses typically will be have electric, you know, so they can heat be heated and air conditioned. Uh, a hoop house is like a, it looks like a greenhouse, but it's not going to have that capability. So it doesn't have electric going to it. So you have to get a little more creative with warming and cooling. My dad's big time into like, you need to put solar on everything. <laughs> I'm like, hold your horse, dad. I'm just trying to learn how to do this. <laughs> we'll put solar on it later. Well, I heard there's um. I guess partially underground greenhouses. I guess you dig down 
six feet and most of the greenhouse is below grade and then you put a cover on it. Have you have you looked at any of those? Nope. I have never nobody that I know has one of those. My dad is trying so hard for me to, you know, make that large hole and cover it. I'm sure one day he will have his way once I feel like I'm firmly established in the things that we've got going on here because we have the space for it. Um, so all I've done is read. All I've done is watch some videos. So I, I don't know anybody locally that's been able to do that. And I, I do wonder, so we, one side of our farm is actually pretty good soil, and the other side, the north side, is all caliche and limestone. And we've actually had, in order to have a garden, we've had to build soil. Like it literally had just an inch. And so, you know, we've done some creative things to build some soil. And I'm thinking if we were to, that's where the space would be. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. We would have to have like, some heavy machinery to be able to get like six feet down into rock and then you would have the drainage issue problems. So I, I don't know if our land is the best place for that because again you know you can read and watch videos to your heart's content but then trying to practice that on your own land like that's where the challenge comes in like you know I had visions for my farm like this is what we're going to do this method's going to work and I mean every year we've had to do something different because it didn't you know, we've had to kind of hybridize, you know. Tell me about some of that. Tell me some of the challenges, unexpected ones that you've had, so the listeners can, you know, avoid them. Maybe. Yeah, so, I mean, that's honestly, that's why we love having people come over to our farm. And that's usually what we share first. We're like, okay, we're going to give you kind of like the, this is, <laughs> this is the reality of having a farm. One, it's extremely hard work physically. I'm very thankful that we have healthy bodies so that we can do the work and the heat and we can do all the, the weeding and the, chasing after cows or chasing after a chicken like you have no idea like how these animals get out but they get out you know it it's been a slow process of putting infrastructure in you know fencing that kind of thing to be able to keep our animals in the on our land versus you know like the other day the cows pushed through a gate that wasn't well latched and the our entire cow herd which is all of six animals walked down burkett road right i was like <laughs> Our whole herd of, of cows just left. And so, you know, there's things like that. And then um, for us, I think because, you know, our anim- our, we have a farmstead. It's a small farm. So we, you know, know our animals well. And so, like, I've struggled with culling an animal. Culling an animal means, you know, getting rid of it, usually through selling it at an auction. Or if it's a sick animal, you know, <laughs> putting it down humanely or, send, you know, sending it off to a place that, you know, loves to rehab animals. That's that's been difficult. I had no idea that the weather could be so mean. I mean, when we were living in McKinney in our little, you know, teeny weeny home, teeny weeny yard, I mean, who, you know, who cares if the, you know, tornado alarm went off? Like, we were fine. Out here, we're on a hill. Like, we had, I mean, I have never been more aware of the weather in my life. In 2016, there was a, a tornado in how and how abuts us. And we got a straight line winds from off that storm, and it took our barn and like rolled it up the hill, and um, that was that was a challenge losing something that we had put you know some blood, sweat, tears, and money into, and you know all of one night it <laughs> flies off and it's no longer usable. Last year we had a horrible hailstorm, and it took all the fruit off of our trees. And so weather has been weather's hard. And then like I said, we already talked about the the bugs like. You know, who knew that these beautiful fruit trees that, you know, these box stores sell, you know, everybody puts one in and they're like, it's going to be awesome and easy. It's not because every bug wants to eat the fruit too. So those would be the, you know, challenges that we've dealt with. But, I mean, I feel like when you deal with challenges like that and you, you know, choose to have a, a, a healthy perspective, you know, kind of seeing it rather than a problem, seen as an opportunity, it kind of creates some resiliency. And so, you know, it's funny how, like, we'll have a hard year, growing year, animal year, something, and there'll be some disappointment. There'll probably be some tears. But it's funny how, like, come springtime, it's like you forget and you just start again. It's a brand-new slate. Let's put in some seeds. Let's get some, have some babies, you know. Like, there's just something that gets created inside of you as a farmer. Like, I'm, farmers are hardcore people. Like, you, like, we hadn't ever dealt with a loss. Like, okay, we might have lost house plants and some hermit crabs when we were living in the city. But we had never dealt with death, right, the death of an animal, um, death of a chicken. Like everybody, they kept calling them, what did they call the chickens? They called them chicken nuggets or something like that. When we first moved onto the farm, they're like, oh, you're just providing food for the wildlife. 
And I was like, no, we're going to protect these chickens. You know, we had a livestock dog and everything, but because the fencing, outside fencing was very poor, man, those, we had coyotes and usually coyotes come and they, one by one. Yeah, I heard every, everyone in the world wants to eat chickens. They do. Well. Are you able to, so is this your main income for yourself at least? Is this how you support yeah. the family with farmer's markets? Yeah, so, well, my husband, he's the principal. So praise the Lord for someone who's not an entrepreneur. I got the entrepreneur thing from my dad. Dad's always doing stuff entrepreneurial. And so, and I always have too. I was a photographer for a while. I did several little, you know, business, like multi-level marketing businesses. I, but when we moved here, you know, it was like it's such a steep learning curve. Like city people, there's no farmers in our background, you know. I mean, maybe, maybe great, great you know, grandfathers, because they would have had to have gardens to have food, you know. But it was very interesting coming here and starting over from scratch, and it was such a steep learning curve. I stopped everything just to figure out how do we do this. And um, so I, we have goats, and there was one day that I looked at them, and I'm like, y'all are kind of expensive. You guys need to make me some money. And so actually that's how I ended up making soap. So I actually do have a little soap-making business. I sell it at the market, um, and I sell it um, at a couple of local stores. And um, now the goats are at least making a little bit of money for us. And then the farming, uh, as far as like. This may be a, a stupid question, but you said you're making soap. You're not making the goats into soap, are you? <laughs> no. How do They're you make soap? <laughs> Maybe it's, okay. I didn't realize you could Yeah, do that. goats. Yep, goats milk. So, I mean, we, we do make cheese, but, like, you know, I can't really sell that very easily at the farmer's market. You know, when it comes to meat and eggs and cheese and things that have to are perishable, you have to have different permits and licenses. And so I've just – we've learned how to do that as a family, and so we, you know, we can consume that as a family because we can. Um, but it's easy to make soap out of goat's milk. Um, it wasn't – I mean, it was been a process, but, like, I mean, before I got on the call, I made about eight batches of soap. So um, – it, once you learn how to do it, it's really fun. And That's I, really because cool. it's, we do everything natural, like it's just essential oils, herbs, clays. Yeah. So, you know, when the world is falling apart, I can, you can come and get some soap and <laughs> stay clean. What percentage of all the things you produce do you guys consume internally versus selling? I guess, you know, if you look at your vegetables, you mostly sell those. You know, you said the, the meat, the eggs. The milk you have to consume yourself because the permits and everything. But again, what do you sell at the farmers market? What percentage of that is what that you guys eat versus sell? Yeah, so that's interesting. A lot of the farmers that I've met, they don't actually eat their food. They just sell it and they go to the grocery store and buy the cheaper. And I was oh like, God. that's weird. No. So we eat the majority of the fruits and vegetables, and essentially we're selling the leftover. That makes sense. So, like, we, we got into yep. homesteading to provide for our family, and so we absolutely consume all that. Now, I mean, I can sell, you know, eggs from my out of my home, and, you know, there's other ways to get around some of the other things. Like, you know, I sell meat to my dad, right? There's – so we keep it – I mean, we're not raising a lot of cows, so I can't – like, there's not even enough meat to go <laughs> more than our family, maybe two others or whatever. So it those kind of things have to be kind of smaller scale, but – when we're growing, if I have a really good crop, you know, we, we save some. You know, that's why it's been important to learn how to can, learn how to ferment, learn how to do, you know, dehydrate, save some of those things for our family for later, and then we just, you know, take the extra to farmer's market. And then when we're even above and beyond farmer's market, like I love stopping by the neighbor's house and giving it away. And then something cool that we started this year, though I'm not sure it's going to pan out as well as I was hoping, but there's a company called Green Cover Seed. And they offered this program called First Acre, and they put together these packages of seeds. It was like a variety of between 20 and 30 different types of seeds that kind of work synergistically. So, you know, peas and beans, those are nitrogen-producing plants, and, you know, a lot of plants need nitrogen to grow. So if you plant peas and beans with other types of plants, you're actually supporting those plants. So um, it was really cool to kind of see these mixes, and so we – kind of roughly plowed up a part of a hill and we I hand broadcast so like old school I just threw it out there and then kind of stomped on it and this this program is you grow this milpa garden or chaos garden because it's got like 30 different types of seeds or plants in it and then you know as you're harvesting you keep 50 percent for yourself or you can sell it or and then you give the other 50 percent away to a local food pantry 
And so I did, I, I, I enrolled in that. Now the goats have gotten in. <laughs> We had it fenced off, but man, those goats, and they're like, we see some tasty corn and some tasty sunflowers, and they managed to push through and, you know, got in and did some destruction. So I may not end up having as much as I was hoping, but I love the premise of it, and it's been really cool to, you know, because one of the big issues I face as a grower is dealing with grasses. I am not, I was not trained in the skill and art of hoeing, like, you know, with a hoe down a, you know, a dirt aisle or whatever to keep out the weeds. That's I am I much rather actually prefer the thing to be a little bigger and I pull it out. Like I just rather pull it out from the roots. And um, so we this year we kind of did this coexisting thing. So I've got a row that we kind of lightly tilled and or used a broad fork down and that's where I planted and I have drip tape that goes down that. And then I have a swath of grass. Because I mean the earth wants to stay covered. Like that's how God created the earth. <laughs> like it's supposed to bring forth life and it does not like being bare. So typically I'll use mulch you know, different types of mulches to try to keep the weeds and grasses down. But, man, up here, the, the nemesis we deal with is uh, Bermuda grass and Johnson grass. And it doesn't matter what type of cover you put on there, it grows over, pokes through. And so we've kind of done this, you know, growing space, grass space, growing space, grass space. And as long as we can keep it mowed and or weed eated, it works really great. Now, we're about to go on vacation, and that's where it gets a little iffy because you can lose your food really fast inside those grasses. Um, well, what, what's but the, what's the, so the grasses are essentially a different version of weeds that corrupt your crops, or what do you mean? Yeah, so, you know, big ag, you know, commercial ag, that's, that's why GMO crops have become such a big deal is because that, the, that seed, that crop, can now be sprayed with a herb, herbicide, and it doesn't destroy the crop, but it destroys the grasses because grasses will take the energy – away from your plant so you know we obviously don't go that direction I'm like we don't have to do that like we just have to be really good weeders we have to be really good hoers and for me like I said I like pathways right because if, if I have a full dirt garden you know and you've got your row of something and then you do, you've got a space where you're going to walk like when it's raining that turns into a big mud pile that's horrible so I've always either mulched or you know covered with cardboard or something like that so this is the first year for me to try you know, just the grass pathway, I, I feel like next year I'm still going to do something different. <laughs> and one of these yeah. days I'll settle on, oh, this is going to be great. But, you know, it's been really fun. So something that I've gotten to put my hand into, there's a, a, a local ministry that I'm a part of, Heart of a Matter, and they um, are starting, like, these enrichment classes. And one of one of the enrichment classes is, is helping, you know, low income or even just whoever start Victory Gardens or I would just call them backyard gardens. And so, you know, even though so if this is where my skill set comes in, because I have tried every type of raised bed garden. I have tried different different ways of, you know, covering within a, a in-ground garden. And so now I know how to do a lot of those things. I know which one of those are, are going to be the most affordable, and I know which ones require a lot more, you know, financial input. And so um, it's been fun starting to create the, you know, um, curriculum for these classes that we're about to start um, and I'm like, I know how to do all of these, all these different types of raised beds. So the, the ministry right next to it is this little plot of land. So we're going to start a little community garden next to it. And so we're in that planning stage right now. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. How do you estimate the amount of time it takes for you to run your farm? Is it like an hour per? So, again, my, my strong set is hard work. So blood, sweat, and tears, that's, that's, I'm your gal. Really good business planning, definitely not not me. So, no, we have not done any major calculations in quite a while. I mean, we do know when we do the hacks at the end of the year, you know, where at least there's there's some profit now. It's not a lot. It's kind of like gets to go back into the farm. So, essentially, we get to keep the farm by the farm. It keeps itself. For my routine or rhythm is usually a couple hours each day. I'm outside. Uh, I don't I don't water anymore by hand. I've got, you know, all kinds of different water systems in. So, that's great. So, turning those on. <laughs> Remember to turn them off. And then it's usually the weeding and uh, cultivating for, for the next, you know, planting season. So, and, and some days I can't, you know, I, you know, I homeschool kids. So that's kind of like takes the majority of the day. And then I kind of just got a couple hours that I do the farm and then, you know, have the soap business. So it's a, it's a definitely a full life. And I mean, I probably could have more time to do it. Um, so it's definitely not farming full time. It is, it is part time farming. And that's anything that's to my, that part time. I'll be honest, it's hard. I feel like my farm gets out of control real fast in this time period, June, July. We created this really cool, like, chicken tractor. 
um, that's going down the rows. So like I, garlic has just gotten harvested, so I've got these two 100-foot rows um, that are now empty. I say empty. They've got lots of weeds and things growing in them. And so this chicken tractor pretty much is the width of the bed. And so the, you know, the first part of it is actually the, where the chickens can actually have shade and then they can get up and roost, and that's where the food and water is, excuse me. And then we created this little kind of cage-like thing that goes in front of it, so it extends the uh, chicken's ability to be able to, you know, get sunshine and actually have more food. So we've been slowly moving this, and this is the first year we've done this, the chicken tractor specifically down the row, and it's like, oh, it's almost ready to plant. So I'll just take my broad fork. So it's like the broad fork is really cool. It looks like a really large pitchfork, like kind of long elongated. You step on it, and it's a way to aerate and kind of till a little bit because you can, as soon as you punch it in the ground and lift it up, it kind of lifts all that soil up, and so it makes it a little easier to get the grass and the weeds and things out. But it maintains the soil structure and all the microbial structure that's there because that, that's the biggest, you know, thing that I've learned. You know, people that keep tilling, 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 you destroy all that mycorrhizal fungi that's needed to help like connect the plants like there's a whole there's a whole underworld that's microscopic yeah. that is super important to the health of that plant to the plant's ability to fight off pests and disease and oh, whenever so you we do, till uh, you do no dig or no till it's sometimes so with heavy clay sometimes you just got like we would ne i wouldn't say never because i know that's not true but for us we had to do kind of a light till so like the first garden we ever had, there was a really kind man who came and was like, hey, how, can I, how about I help you till up a garden? So he, it was good to have him do that big till so that now there was some actual air put in there. Because, you know, clay, clay is a good growing medium once it's been amended, right? Because it actually has a lot of minerals and things in it. It's just so compact and like, you know, you pick up a, you pick up a quad after it's been out in the Texas heat and sun like it's like a brick right so it's learning how to amend so I we kind of do a little bit of both but once once you know like I said I had this beautiful row we pulled the garlic out of and then we put the chickens down it and then all I have to do is this light broad fork and then I can plant into that and I didn't have to till it at all so essentially I use tilling for kind of like if I'm breaking new ground or potatoes I found that you know I have to kind of till along the potato row so I can hill it um, that's worked best. I know there's, I've tried some different ways. You can container grow potatoes. You can straw bale potatoes. And I'm just not real good at those methods. And I'm like, I have acres of land. Why would I put them in containers? Why would, you know what I'm saying? So I, yeah. I have a little bit of compromise. So <laughs> we're not legalistic about anything. We, we're like, if, if we need to do it, well, the only thing I don't do, is there's been no chemical on my land in eight years. Nothing. Oh, nice. And I mean, I've been so tempted. I picked up a a jar of seven dust. Seven dust is not organic at all. And because um, I was those cucumber beetles were super annoying. I was like, because they just eat. They nibble, 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 and they just start destroying all the leaves. And if you destroy the leaves huh. of the plant, then there's no photosynthesis, and then that plant dies. And so I'm look, that looking might at eat those, eat those beetles. So I don't know about predator eating them. So I mean, I've, like there was. So squash bugs are actually usually my real nemesis. They just will eat those zucchini plants up like nobody's business. And so, like, there was one year I put the chickens in there to see if they would eat the squash bugs. But squash bugs are kind of a relative of the stink bug, and they smell, and the chickens wouldn't eat them. So the biggest thing with squash bugs has been, like, just early detection. Like, I have gotten so used to just being out there and squishing bugs in my fingers. Like, that used to be, like, a kind of a yucky thing like who wants to squish bugs but I will go out there and I will kill 50 to 100 and I come back in and my hands are like black and green I'm like, does a, anybody want a hug did you do fresh squeeze uh, squash bug juice uh -huh. yes like yes yes interesting for people that haven't done any of this yet that are listening and are curious what's like a really easy baby step that they could take <laughs> to start you know taking control of their food and, and their lives you know is it microgreens or like what would you recommend if if someone doesn't have the land that doesn't have the space and is just afraid of the hard work and time like how can they dip their toe in well the, f the first thing i would say is get connected to a local farmer find the farmer's market find the csa right so if you don't want to do it go find the one that is doing it <laughs> so you've got those because i'm like you know with the possible food shortages with some of these global issues that have been coming up like i feel like local farming is imperative like you need to have a farmer and 
10 homes or 20 homes around that farmer, I feel like that's the better way to do it, right? It's like that's these little communities around a farm, around a church, around, you know, like we need that community and collaboration. So find those resources. I feel like they're very doable. Facebook's made that very easy. You can do several searches. But as far as doing some things on your own at your own home, I've, yeah, you mentioned microgreens. That was that was one of the first things we did, microgreens and sprouts. Um, those are super fun. At, you know, if they've got a home and they don't have an HOA, yeah. you know, change your, your front beds into food. So when we, when we came here, to this land, um, I, I ripped out every plant, everything, because it wasn't food. Um, and I literally have put in, it's all perennial herbs now, so it's not like I typically don't grow my tomatoes in my front bed or whatever. But that's, you know, if that's all you got, you know, and you want to do just a little bit, like put it, do it in a pot. So I want to say pot growing is really hard, like, you know, in a, like a growing pot, like you have to stay on that water um, pretty consistently, so that's actually kind of challenging. But yeah, microgreens are super fun, super easy super good for your body. Um, I actually sold those for quite a while at, mar at Farmer's Market, um, but that's an easy thing for people to do. Yeah. So finding the resources, starting with, like, you know, even if you've got, like, a south-facing window and you get a little shelf and, you know, you can get some pots, you know, and start the easy things. Greens are going to be the easiest thing to actually grow, you know, to where you can eat. You know, it's harder to grow a tomato plant inside your house, and you really can't usually grow a melon inside. So you'll be limited to, you know, radishes and because radishes are very quick growing as well. They take like 24 days and then you got a radish. So yeah, no, that's pretty good. So what's next for you guys? What uh, what do you want to incorporate over the next year to keep the farm, you know, growing and improving? So things that have been in my heart. Um, well, one, we we definitely need to finish the hoop house. So we've got some growing beds in it. So it's being used. So the space is used. It's just not been covered. So like I need to go ahead and purchase like a like a shade cloth for the you know that heavy sun during you know June July August and then get the actual cover for extending the growing season because in Texas we really are super blessed to have multiple growing seasons like we easily I would I would say we have three seasons for growing definitely two and with a, a hoop house you can extend that right so come you know uh, October when things are starting to cool down a little bit like if I've got that cover on there I can grow into November and December you know, and if I need to get creative, I can, I can string up, you know, some Christmas lights out there and, you know, that actually make heat, not LEDs, you know, incandescents, and I could help, you know, prevent some, you know, frost or whatever. So that's probably our first, like, we need to finish that. And then uh, we've kind of kicked the idea around of actually having a CSA, and that's, you know, just getting a commitment from 5, 10, 15 families and growing specifically for them, you know, and then that April to October period of time providing them with, a box of veggies and fruits, maybe meats, eggs. Um, and so then we're actually supporting that 10 to 15 families. And they support back because it's kind of one of those things that kind of prepay ahead of time, say, okay, I'm committing to you. You know, and you get a list of, like, these are our favorite veggies, you know, and make sure that you get those planted. And that way, you know, the money for seed and that kind of thing's already, like, that's already ready. Because that's always the hardest part for me is I'm hitting January, February, March, and I'm preparing, preparing, preparing. And then I'm like, you know, we haven't started market yet. So that money, that income hasn't really come in yet. So that's the nice thing about a CSA is they're typically, they're paying into that. And then I would love to do farm camp with kids because, you know, I feel like that's, our kids are really good workers because they're farm kids. They have farm chores, right? Each kid has a different animal group and they you know, help, you know, with collecting the eggs and feeding the chickens or milking the goats and, you know, the different things. And that's created a really a strong work ethic in our kiddos. And, of course, I feel like the skills, you know, they, they know now where food comes from, <laughs> meat and otherwise. And yeah, just make you know, giving that exposure to other kids in our community. So, like, I've always, I've, I've, the last year or so, I've just kind of been kicking that idea around of, of doing a summer you know, farm camp where they can come and I can teach them how to can. I can, you know, we can go out to the garden, go pick cucumbers, bring those back inside, wash them off, cut them up, you know, create the, you know, the brine and then actually can and make, you know, pickles, you know, all in, you know, that time that they're with me. And then, you know, the next day go and go down and milk the goats and come back up with that fresh milk and, you know, add the, what would be needed to create the cheese, you know, make cheese right there with the kids. So I would love to eventually do that. But again, there's just, there's a lot that gets involved in that. So 
yeah, that's kind of where we'd love to head for the future. We're, I mean, we're super thankful that we've been given the opportunity to have this land and space to learn and, you know, get involved in the community and, you know, That's awesome. you know, like I said, I was, you know, I was a nurse, right? And you get to go into nursing to help people heal and be well. And, you know, I had to close that door. But here we are opening the farming door. And ultimately, that's what farmers are doing, too, providing food for people's health, right? And I love herbs. Like, we grow lots of herbs. I create herbal tea mixes. And that's honestly our medicine. So, I mean, you teach someone how to garden, you're teaching them how to, you know, help them eat well and take take back their health, right? Because you can grow medicine, right? I mean, we are, we keep things very basic around here. We use colloidal silver. We use uh, activated charcoal. Um, I make something called fire cider, and that is simply like garlic and onion and cayenne, horseradish, all put into a base of apple cider vinegar, and you let that ferment for a couple of weeks, and that's like super duper medicine. We we use that when the big C came and visited our house, and it worked awesome. So what else? And elderberry syrup. I mean, we, we wildcraft wild elderberries. We've got a ton that grow nearby, and we dry those and then just add honey and a bunch of different, like, really potent herbs to that. And, again, we, we keep that on hand. So that's literally our medicine. So um, yeah, it's, it's been fun. It's really cool. I mean, where do you suggest people find out more? I don't know if you want people to contact you or not. If you know, if so, oh, yeah. what, how can they? Yeah, know, so, if they, if they just look up YouTube and read and learn, or where do they go? Yeah, I wish I'd started my YouTube channel long ago. That hasn't happened. We just have Facebook pages. We've kept it real simple. So Grace Acres Farm on Facebook, uh, Rustic Herbal Soap on Facebook, and then you can usually contact me that way. And then, yeah, if they're not on Facebook, I mean, the email is the same. Well, Grace Acres Farm ex at gmail.com and then rustic herbal soap at gmail.com well very good Terrence it's been really great to talk to you and I appreciate you coming on the podcast thank you very much yeah you bet it's good to meet you Richard I appreciate it if you like this podcast please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes you've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.